Hi, my name is Stephanie and today I want to talk to you about something called perseveration. I do want to know before we get into this that perseveration is not unique to autism. While it is commonly seen in autism, it can also be seen in other conditions like ADHD, OCD, even brain injuries, and that is definitely not a comprehensive list. So that's just one of those things I want to let you guys know before you think like, oh, I do that. That definitely means autism. That's not necessarily the case. If you watched my video recently-ish <laughs> on the executive function of cognitive flexibility or sometimes also called flexible thinking. You're likely familiar with the concept of autistic people and people who have issues with cognitive flexibility having trouble switching tasks or switching kind of like the focus or stuff like that. Basically being able to switch and roll with the punches and that kind of thing is what cognitive flexibility is. So if you're able to be able to switch topics or switch tasks or go from one thing to another and shift pretty easily, then that would be pretty decent cognitive flexibility. Now, instead of just saying someone has trouble with cognitive flexibility, there's actually a word for what happens that's kind of the opposite, which would be perseveration. This actually has a little bit to do with another executive function called inhibition. There appears to be many definitions for perseveration, but I found this source quite useful. The definition of perseveration is the continuation or recurrence of an experience or activity without the appropriate stimulus. Goldstein described perseveration as an inability to inhibit a previous thought. When Jasper helped to define perseveration, he wrote that the cause of this phenomenon is the tendency of a set of neurons, once excited, to persist in the state of excitement autonomously, showing resistance to any change in this state. Allison went on to describe perseveration as the continuance or recurrence of a purposeful response which is more appropriate to a preceding stimulus than to the succeeding one which has just been given and which is essential to provoke it. Perseveration is involuntary. By definition, it does not occur without previous stimulation and is not a spontaneous phenomenon. This same source later notes that perseveration has been well documented in thought, speech, and in motor movements. We tend to consider these perseverative movements as stims or self-stimulatory behavior, and they might also be described as stereotypies. So the concept of being stuck would more accurately or technically be called perseveration. And this often happens in thought, which then makes itself evident through speech. Perseveration in conversation can be pretty obvious. You're having a conversation with someone, you were talking about subject subject A, you move on to subject B, but the person you're talking to, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, starts talking about subject A again with absolutely no prompting. That would be probably because their mind is still stuck on subject A and they have not moved with you to a subject B. So that would be like a perseverative thought or the inability to inhibit that thought and the inability of, you know, the cognitive flexibility to move on and switch to a different train of thought or conversation, etc. Now this could be because it's something that really bothered them and they weren't done talking about it and you try to move on and they weren't done and they just wanted to express their emotion or express their thoughts, but sometimes this can be really just because the thought can't really be inhibited in their mind and they're just kind of stuck there. And that would be more of a perseverative thought. Now, while I'm sure I have experienced this plenty of times, there's something about seeing it play out in someone else in front of you that is just more striking to realize all the parts that are happening and then to recognize oh, I do that, and try to help them. One time I was talking to somebody and we were on a conversation and an issue had arisen and they were worried about what was going on. And even though the situation was fine, they were still concerned with it. So their mind was stuck on this thing. And even though they tried to move past it to be able to deal with the incoming information, so there are people who wanted 
some other questions answered. They were trying to, you know, access thought for those other questions, but they couldn't because they were stuck on this thing that they were worried about. So even though it wasn't necessarily rational to be worried about this thing, they were stuck there and they couldn't address these other things that were incoming and it was becoming very frustrating. And I could tell it was just like watching someone, their brain is just like, they can't. And of course, people who don't understand what's going on, that might be frustrating. Why aren't you answering my questions? It was just really strange to see it play out in front of me and realizing what I'm seeing. So in those cases, if it is something that is distressing, like a distressing thought and something that needs to be addressed, in the best case scenario, there would be someone who would be able to observe that and say, okay, they're really stuck on this thing and to come back and address it. Because you come back and address that thing sometimes can kind of get it unstuck, if that makes sense. So whatever it is that's saying, this isn't okay, we can't switch because of X, Y, and Z. If you can take away the anxiety around this being stuck, and address it with them and maybe walk through it with them, maybe verbalize it for them. They might not be able to verbalize what's going on, but if you noticed and you're tr you might be able to work with someone to verbalize it and work with them to kind of get through that. So that way then you can move on to address other questions. So I thought that was really interesting to see, just again, for me, uh, <laughs> even though I experienced that in my head a lot, if you are seeing someone experience perseveration in a distressing manner, trying to just push them on to another subject and ignoring what they're doing over here is probably not the best idea. That's probably going to make them frustrated or more upset because it's not that they're just like, hey, I just wanna hang out over here. It's, it, it, your mind is stuck here. Like I can't move on from this. And it's more frustrating when you realize you can't move on from this and people expect you to. Now, perseverative speech can also be considered echolalia. We've talked about echolalia also before on this channel. I'll link the video up in a card. I always forget what side it is. Now that would only be certain types of echolalia though, because obviously just repeating back one time what someone said as you're learning a language, which is technically a form of echolalia, wouldn't really be perseveration, right? Or perseverative speech. However, there are definitely forms of perseverative speech that are also echolalia. If you're gonna be repeating a word over and over, repeating phrases over and over, sentences over and over, those sorts of things, that's perseverative speech and also would fall under echolalia. Now, from my understanding, a perseverative speech doesn't necessarily always mean echolalia. Someone may be saying that someone is having perseverative speech when they're just continuously talking about the same topic. So they got stuck on that topic and they're not going to stop. Sure, someone can just to you later on their thoughts were stuck but usually obviously we can't see in inside of other people's minds <laughs> so usually they tell us right or they show us that these thoughts are happening by what's coming out of their mouth so I think that's an interesting kind of crossover of perseverative thinking and perseverative speech a lot of times this can also be talking about the same subject in the same way. Maybe they've developed a script for how they like to talk about it and then like to, of course, you know, maybe cite certain scenes and recite certain dialogue and stuff like that. So that would fall under perseverative speech. I find that mention of the neurons that once they're excited, they kind of continue to go on and basically connect and they don't want to stop or change or anything like that. I find that interesting because I do believe that is the core reason of why autism exists. We've seen research on the overconnectivity in the inside autistic brains. We've seen where different parts are connected for longer than they would be in a non-autistic person, maybe for just a few seconds, but those few seconds matter a lot when it goes on inside of your brain. And then there's also the whole thing with having too many synapses and too many kind of routes and different routes because of kind of a thing to do with synaptic pruning, a bunch of sciencey things and how that goes on in your brain. But it is interesting because the concept that that is one of the things they're seeing different in the autistic brain is actually similar to why or is the reason why we see so much perseveration in autistic people. Anyway, I hope this video helped you learn a little bit about perseveration and what it means and how it has to do with autism and all those sorts of things. <laughs> if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a like and let me know your thoughts about all of this in the comments below. If you're interested in autism content from me, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I do upload to this channel 
channel every Thursday at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you to everyone who supports me through YouTube as channel members and my patrons through Patreon. And a special thank you to my spaz tier patron, Jesse Graves. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you're having a wonderful week and I will see you in my next video. Bye. Bye.